Well, let's get more on gold stellar run, see what's uh, moving across the commodity complex. Jonathan Barrett's at Commodity Broking Services in Sydney. Jonathan, a warm welcome to you. I guess the question would be, if this volatility continues, if this equity rally proves to be short-lived, uh, will indeed gold only take another leg up? Yeah, Carson, mm. I think that's, uh, that's, that's what we're all looking at, I guess, at the moment. But, but we are seeing just so much volatility, it's just very hard to actually trade. Um, you're looking at between $50 to $70 worth of volatility. On one COMEX contract, you're looking at about close to a $7,000 worth of fluctuation. Mm. So I would anticipate probably margins uh, on the CME to go up, mm. which might actually force a few hands for those who are already long gold. Mm. But, but at the end of the day, I think, I think that the volatility is telling us that we're, we're going to struggle to find new news to see it trade up through 2000. And, and I'm trying to work out what that new news will be, given that most of it's on the table. What about a, a sizable splinter inside Europe? If the ECB says enough of buying bonds is up to the market now, let them decide and no one steps in. Well, I think that in itself is something we've got to continue to monitor. We know there are concerns. We also know that Spain came out and said that they don't need any help. Um, so, so when I look at it, I, I think that that's still a, a, an issue. It's still there, but we know about it. It's not a surprise. Mm. Right. So I think we've just got to monitor it, uh, monitor it and continue right. to monitor it um, to see what, in fact, will be the result. If the ECB right. have to step in, they have to step in. Yeah. But at least we know where we're at. But didn't we say that about Ireland? They said they didn't need help, and they did. Greece well, said they didn't need help, they did. Uh, you know, who's right? <laughs> well, we've got to give it the benefit of, the, of what they can actually manage. Right. Um, and I think that's what we're looking at. I think Europe does yeah. remain a concern for us. But you've also got to look in, in retrospect as to why gold is actually doing this moving. Why is it moving? Is it, is it the fact that there is no supply or limited supply of the metal? Or is it the fact that we do have these such grave concerns out there? Uh, and I'm starting to, to lead towards the fact that it's, it's really got more to do with the lack of supply in the market that's causing these moves. Because mm. when you see the volatility, the sheer size of the moves that we've had, you've really got to question whether there's something else out there uh, rather than just the, you know, the threat um, or the concerns we have of this contagion. What levels do you eye with ever more interest to see that some of the fundamental buying action might be under threat? I'm talking about the Indian wedding season, uh, dowries, all yeah. of that, that, that traditionally would underpin uh, a, a lot of gold's position to a certain level, but beyond that, it all becomes the domain of ETFs and high-frequency mm. trade. Are we in that zone? Have we got some way to go before we get mm. there? I mean, where, mm. where, where does it all shake out at? Well, I think this is, a, this is an interesting thing. In India, mm. when the prices of, price of gold uh, really started to start its rally, um, you're looking from about 1,200 through to about you know, that uh, 1500, uh, Indians' imports of gold are uh, substantially reduced. Mm. Um, they're basically all dried up. People thought it was too high and they can't afford it. Um, I think that that, is, that will repeat itself, where that physical demand from uh, the traditional buyers uh, just won't be there. That could create a little bit of a hole. But, but building that back up, it's that sheer demand for ETFs. Mm. Um, you know, which we're seeing, and the fact that more people can then can get can buy gold. I think one of the interesting things to note is that a lot of the equities in gold aren't particularly moving with the price of gold, mm. and that to me sort of gives us a sense that it's more of the speculative player in the market uh, rather than that that investor really looking for that uh, bargain. What about the Chinese investor though, underpinning uh, renewed concerns about their growth, uh, their job outlook? they would have every reason to be propping this market up. Are you seeing signs of that? Well, well, not at the moment. I mean, even, I mean, yesterday we did see the CPI number come out, um, and after that we saw about a $20, $30 rally in gold. Uh, the appetite is certainly there in China, um, but I think at the end of the day, people have to start to realise what represents good value. Mm. Now, take back to your question, where do I want to buy the metal again? You know, at what level do I think it's safe? Um, mm. It's very hard to buy the metal, you know, at 1780, given that, that we need to see new news, or what in fact will be the news that forces it to 2000. Right. Likewise, we know the support levels now, the support levels do come in at 1660 and 1500. So there's still a lot of volatility, but if I do get back to that trend line, 
which is what really what we can only look at these days. Um, when we get back to some of these trend lines, that's the only real areas we can actually look at. And I think 1660 is probably where it would represent the better value, you know, to get back on. So you think it's overbought at these levels? I think it's very hard to. I mean, I think just given the volatility, as I've mentioned, you know, just, just a, a, a small amount of gold, you're going to have to hold on to it. For, for a very long time well we've got to see any new news that comes through the volatility will hurt a lot of people because a lot of people actually play it with leverage and and I think to me that's the big no-no at the moment uh, because that leverage play and the increase in the margins are going to keep that volatility with us let's talk crude prices you're saying yeah. the lower they go the better for the global economy yeah. uh, you can understand that in one sense you could also though say that the global economy uh, is shifting to a lower growth profile and that's only being underscored by where the price is settling hmm. well I think Carson that the lower growth forecast is as a result of the higher prices hmm. so you know when you look at where crude is and where it's uh, where it is at the moment I actually think it uh, represents good value hmm. uh, you know between that uh, 85 through to 75 in fact 85 to 80 I think is, is exceptionally good value uh, look I guess it's you got to look at it um, growth is slowing down what's the best thing well if you get a primary input as a 20% saving from $100 then that's a 20% saving that goes to more profitability for the company. Mm. Obviously, we've got to see demand stay where it is, and hopefully the, F minutes, the minutes from the FOMC meeting suggested that interest rates will stay low, helping to help that uh, alien US economy. So if interest rates remain low there, primary inputs remain low, then I've got to be encouraged that this is probably the first step, the first decent step in a recovery that isn't suffered with stimulus. Copper was subject to some technical selling overnight. It was one of the few, uh, few uh, metals not to close higher. What makes it more vulnerable to that technical selling versus, say, the crude complex? Mm. I just uh, cast, it's just the players involved, yeah. the hedge funds, hedge funds which are involved in the metal. Uh, yeah. you know, copper's had that big fall. Uh, you know, we've seen um, easing in um, uh, labour issues over in Chile. Uh, so, if anything, I think copper in itself still has some, some, um, something overhanging it at the moment uh, in terms of the supply side of it. So, I, I actually feel that it's technically based, but I think there's also some fundamentals in it where copper has been very steady for such a long time. And uh, that correction which we've had, I think, is a correction on the back of what's happening in the economies, but also on the back that we've got more supply coming back onto the market from those labour disputes which we had in es Escondida. Okay, wild volatile ride for our currency yesterday. Did that just prove to you that some of the fundamentals that might have been said to be baked in just aren't present behind mm. the, the hold above parity? Well, look, I, I think if anything, mm. yesterday's move, you've got to really, you've got to distance yourself from it because mm. uh, there was a panicked market. Um, to see a currency move as far fast and as fast as it did. It's just uh, longs just liquidating, people panicking out of the markets. Um, as a result of that, the dust will settle, fundamentals will come back into play, and then people will start to think that, hey, look, the interest differential, the Australian economy is not as bad as the US, the interest differential is positive. So, so therefore, it'll gradually work its way up just purely on the back of those fundamentals. Well, fundamentally, you're saying, though, it is still, though, a risk play, right? That, that, that's, that's, it's, not a, it's not a yen, it's not a Japanese yen, it's not a Swiss franc safe haven play. Oh, look, I, I, think it, I think the Aussie in itself has proven that it, that it actually it is a stable play. I mean, I'm sure we had the volatility, but you just look, the fundamentals and the interest differentials are what drive some of the investors. And if people start to feel that the commodity cycle sort of has had a big hit and it's on a major low, then, you know, this is the time when people look to get in. We do have a floor in place, and that floor obviously is yesterday's low. So I think any dip back to parity I think would be well looked at or well sought after mm. as, a, as a chance to get in. Because, I mean, you say a fundamental and an, infra an interest rate differential, those are two quite competing uh, factors pushing against the, the currency, against the local unit. Oh, no, when you look at the Aussie, yeah. buying, like, going long Aussie against the US, it's, it's certainly very strong. So that, that's certainly there. Um, the commodity plays in themselves, we actually feel that some of the commodities are at levels which we think are fair value. Um, the market might not see it today, but they probably will in about two, three weeks' time, um, you know, when some of these commodities do have uh, a reasonable bounce. OK, expecting the imports to take over the exports when we get that Chinese surplus data to out today? Um, yeah, at the moment, I think we do. Um, look, at the moment, the domestic economy seems to be cooling, so uh, I think we'll probably see that, uh, that occur. 
Jonathan, have a good one. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks, Carson. Jonathan Barrett from Commodity Broking Services.